Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. We're working. Yeah. Okay. Right. Welcome back. I should say, you should be saying to me, welcome back. Uh, I was really pleased when, when Glenn contacted me and asked me if I would if I would preach this Sunday, because we were looking at Oktoberfest happening, and as the Lord would, would have it, the uh, hurricane made that not possible, but I'm glad that uh, nevertheless he asked me to preach, and because the Lord knew ahead of time that Glenn would not be feeling well. And so, so here I am, and I'm appreciative of the opportunity. We're continuing on in our study of Nehemiah. It is a very interesting book. And uh, we've, we've, we've gone through, I think, about four chapters so far, seeing about how God has worked in the life of Nehemiah to do work that God wanted him. And, and we, we keep talking about how Nehemiah did this. And, and one of the things I hope that we'll see today is that there were a lot of unsung heroes, the people who were actually doing the work. Keep in mind how big this wall was. It was very high. It was 16 feet thick, and it was somewhere in the neighborhood of four miles in circumference. Uh, so if you stretched it out as a single line, it would stretch a good long way. 16 feet thick, very high. You had a lot of people who were working on this thing, but yet Nehemiah is the one who gets most of the credit for it because the book is named after him. Now, in a project like Nehemiah's Wall, it goes through stages, and I once read uh, where a cynic cynical guy had read that there were five stages to every project. The first stage is euphoria and excitement. The project is now, it's in the minds of people, they're excited about it happening, great hopes, great expectations, people are visualizing this goal of the, of the project being done, camaraderie, great spirit, but it isn't long before stage number two comes in. Disenchantment and discouragement and disillusionment. Uh, that's a time when reality sets in, when the project is found to be nowhere as easy as they thought it was going to be. Resources are scarcer and harder to get. Uh, the project, the end of this project looks so far away. Deadlines are being missed, and now that leads to stage three. Frantic search for the guilty party. Now we need to find somebody to blame for this thing. Surely some, but somebody needs to be blamed for this thing, and we've got to find that person. And, okay, we didn't really find the guilty party because we didn't look too hard because chances are that guilty party was us. So that leads to stage four, punishment of the innocent. People who had nothing to do with the problem, they're the ones who are being punished. Sounds like government, doesn't it? And, and it leads to the final stage as people are muddling through, the project is done, and the final stage, laud and honor for non-participants. The people who are, who are praised and they get the, the awards at the annual awards banquet who had nothing to do with it. Okay, well, I'm being, I'm being facetious here, but we've got a big project going on, and that project is this terrific wall. Now, I'm sure there was a lot of excitement about this wall being built. Uh, Nehemiah came into town, as you remember, uh, the Lord worked a miraculous work in putting it in his heart. And then on top of that, then he, he, he went and he spoke to, to King Artaxerxes, who then also got I wouldn't say excited about it, but he was very helpful with it, and he let him go, and he helped provide for the expenses of it too, and then um, and then he got the people on board with it, and they started building it, and and so we're in that stage now where things are starting to go a little down the hill, and so the first thing that we talked about is how. Um, how Nehemiah and, and the wall builders were being opposed. You remember Sanballat and Tobiah? You know, we talked about the various stages. The first stage was mild scorn, and you can see that in Nehemiah 2.19, where they were scorning him, saying, oh, come on, this wall, nothing's going to happen here. And then they saw that the wall was being built, so Sanballat and Tobiah then started ridiculing them in anger. That's in, in uh, Nehemiah 4, verse 1. And then, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, then Sanballat and Tobiah tried to get them to doubt themselves. And then, the stage 4 of opposition, they opposed them through the threats of physical attack. 
We're going to attack and kill you. That was in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 7 through 15. And then stage five. Hey, let's get together and have a peaceful settlement of this. Just go ahead and leave the work there. Come over here, you know, some miles away, and we'll have peace talks about it. And the whole plan was, of course, Scripture talks about how they were wanting to lure Nehemiah away and kill him. And that's in chapter 6, verses 1 through 19. Then, opposition through attacks on his personal character in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Then there was opposition through the use of fear via counsel by trusted men. We saw that at the end of the last time I preached here, where, where the, 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 the high priest went and talked to Nehemiah and said, you know, really, you know, that these guys aren't bad guys at all. You really ought to go and have counsel with them. And he found out uh, through, through the Lord speaking to him, Nehemiah found that this priest, who is a trusted guy, who he should have been able to trust in, he was uh, trying to lure Nehemiah to his death too. But the thing is, we discovered that, that these godly leaders always first turn to God in prayer. And we, we see that constantly in Nehemiah. Whenever a problem came up, then I spoke to the Lord, then went to the Lord in prayer. He just constantly go back, goes back in prayer. But in addition to opposition that we get from outside, you know, we're going to have that opposition from the outside going on all the time. Sometimes there is a focus of opposition through discouragement on the inside. And that's what we're talking about today. In fact, this is actually a two-part message because the last part of this message we're going to get into and I'm going to talk about it briefly. But then next time we get together, I'm going to examine that and, and have a whole message on that last part. And I'll get to that in a minute. But now, one characteristic of godly leaders is they know that circumstances will happen from the inside to try to discourage them. And if you know it's going to happen, you can kind of be ready for it. Most of the time we forget about it, though. Now, Satan conspires to discourage us all the time. When our kids were little, now they're all grown and out of the house. Our youngest, man, our youngest, her birthday is tomorrow. She's going to be 33. But uh, when our kids were at home, we jokingly, when th we would have discouraging times come up, we would have a quote. We would use a quote from Anne of Green Gables. Anybody ever read Anne of Green Gables or saw, saw it? Anne of Green Gables had a quote. My life is a perfect graveyard of buried hopes. So whenever our kids would come up to us with some sob story, I would look at them and say, my life is a perfect graveyard of buried hopes. Okay, get used to it. We're going to get discouraged. Now, where does, where does this term discouragement come from? It actually comes from the French word courage. Okay, discourage. What does courage mean? Well, courage comes from a Latin word, uh, choraticum, cor choraticum, and that core means heart as in cardiology, you know, that, so discouragement means disheartenment. Uh, the word des, D-E-S, is a French word which means away, which says going away. So it's our hearts going away from us. Uh, and so when you're discouraged, your heart is just kind of going away from you. Um, the heart that you had, that you could get the work done, now that heart is going away. And Satan knows that one of the greatest weapons that he can use against us is to get that heart going away from us. Because look, in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6, go ahead and look. In Nehemiah 4, 6. In Nehemiah 4, 6, it says, So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its height. Why? How, would they, how were they able to get this wondrous thing done? For the people had a mind to work. Well, if you look at that in the Hebrew, the word is Vayehi Lebleam Lasof. Leb is the word heart. The people had a heart to work. The people didn't have a mind to work. The people had a heart to work. And that's what that Hebrew word means. They had the heart to work, so they were working hard. And so Satan knows that when you want the work to stop, whatever that work is, whether you're raising kids, whether you're trying to encourage grandchildren, whether you know, you're doing some kind of work for God in the lives of other people, helping build them up, how can, you know, he's going to come in with opposition from the outside, but he's also going to try to discourage you from the inside. So the first discouragement factor, I've got four factors that discourage folks. Number one, loss of strength. 
We'll start off in Nehemiah chapter 4, and I'm going to read the first 10 verses. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. Okay, now, I want to go back and uh, reiterate something. That word, he was angry and greatly enraged. We'll talk about that word again in a minute. But in the Hebrew, it means he was hot. He was hot, Sanballat was, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah, now remember, Tobiah was his his trusty sidekick. Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what they're building, if a fox goes up on it, he'll break down their little stone wall. And Nehemiah says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out. So first thing is this opposition is coming from the outside. The first thing that Nehemiah does is go to the Lord in prayer. Don't cover their guilt. Don't let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a heart to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard of the, that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward that, and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. There you go again, that hot. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion, confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as protection against them day and night. Now, here's where the discouragement is. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild this wall. And so, now, what what Sanballat and Tobiah could not do through outside trying to get them to fear, it was now starting to happen on the inside because these folks are just getting worn out. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit later about some, you know, some of the things that these people were having to go through. But so this weariness is coming in the middle of a crisis. So you got a crisis. You got these people who are coming up saying, "Hey, we're going to kill you. Uh, we're going to attack you." And then on top of that, these people are just getting worn out. Um, Satan doesn't play fairly. He hits us when we're at our weakest. Isn't that true? We're tired. We're worn out. We're sick. And so that's when Satan decides, okay, now I can hit him with discouragement. I mean, think about Job. Go ahead and take a look at Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, Job is an interesting man. He went through a lot. Now, just just follow me here. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters, Job's sons and daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Verse 14. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So, you've lost a lot of stuff here. Now, while he was yet speaking, there came another who said, The fire from God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another who said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another who said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came upon them. It came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they're dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So it's just boom, 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 just happening one right after the other. And Satan knows that he can try to steal our hearts, get us descouraged, get our hearts to leave us when we're when we're at our most vulnerable, we're we're tired, we have all of these things happening, and he just hits us one right after the other. But it's interesting in verses 21 and 22 what Job said. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. How many times do people say, well, God, why are you letting this happen to me? God, you know, going on and on, blaming God for the things that are happening. So, 
Likewise, we shouldn't be surprised at all when we're hit with discouraging circumstances in the midst of a crisis and it happens one right after the other. You know, oh man, why, why can't it just be a little easier? You know? Well, why were they so worn out? In verse 10 of uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, in Judah it was said, the strength of those who bears the burdens is failing. Now these wall builders have been at it from sun up, and I don't want to say till sundown because they're going in into the night, and they've been going at it for about a month without let up. I assume that they did they didn't work during the Sabbath, so I assume that they had one day off. But they're going six days a week from sun up as soon as they have light enough to work until working into the evening. Nehemiah chapter four, read in verse twenty one. So we labored at the work, and half of them held spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothing, except uh, each kept his weapon at his right hand. Now this this idea of the strength failing the burn in, in verse in verse uh, ten in Judah it was said the strength of those who bear burdens is failing. This word failing is the Hebrew word kashal, which means to totter, to waver. And I'm not talking like a drunken man. I'm talking just worn out. These people are just worn out. Their, their strength is kashal. Their strength is tottering. Their strength is wavering. And, and, and the whole idea is through kind of a weariness of the legs. And they're faltering. They're stumbling. They're just tired. They're worn out. And they were worn out to the point, as we often say it, they were dead on their feet. We'll talk about how that was dealt with in a minute. Discouragement factor number two comes right along with it. And that is a loss of vision. A loss of vision of, of, of where they're headed. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. In verse 10, there is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild this wall. There's too much rubble. Much rubble. The, the, this word rubble in the Hebrew means heaps. There's just piles and piles of rubble all the way around. Now earlier, when, when we were in our first stages of talking about the book of Nehemiah, I talked about how Nehemiah had come into town, he got on a donkey, and at night he went out to survey. You know, What are we even talking about here? How much of the wall needs to be rebuilt? Is part of it built? What's going on? And you remember, he went out at night. He didn't tell anybody about what he was doing. And there was so much rubble around that he couldn't even ride the donkey. He had to lead the donkey because there were so many piles that were there. And uh, now the way that Nehemiah was looking at it was, man, we don't even have to go to Home Depot. Everything we need is right here. I mean, this guy's very positive. It's all right here. The rubble is the wall. We just need to move it from this pile and put it onto the wall. So he had a very positive attitude about it. The other folks, their vision was lost on that. No longer were they seeing Home Depot. They were just seeing piles and piles of rock. And and, 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 and so the last time I preached here, I um, alluded to a story that's found in, in Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus fed the 5,000. Wonderful time. And it was more than 5,000. It was 5,000 men. And so there were more than 5,000. So here Christ had fed 5,000 people, more than 5,000, with a few fish and a few loaves. And then after that, then it says he compelled the disciples to get into the boat. Come, come on, come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Get in the boat. Get in the boat. I need you to go over to the other side. And so he's hurrying them along, getting them into that boat. And he said, I, I will stay here and uh, finish up with these folks here. And, and, so, and he said, I want you to row to the other side. So they're rowing over to the other side. You remember what happened as they were rowing over to the other side? A storm came. And the wind was contrary to them. The wind is trying to blow them the other way, and they are rowing, and, but they're doing what God told them to do. God told them, go to the other side. And they're, they're saying, okay, we're not turning around and going back. God told us to go this way. So we're rowing, but we're not getting anywhere. And their strength is failing. They're getting discouraged. They're getting scared about this. Did Christ know that this storm was going to happen? Yes, he put them in that storm. He put them in it. He compelled them to get in the boat. Hurry, get in the boat. Start rowing across. 
He knew that that storm was going to be there. They didn't know it. And then they're rolling away. And what's the first thing that you and I do when a storm hits? Oh, well, this must not be God's will for our lives. Let's turn around and go back. No, it is. God ordained that storm to be in your life, as discouraging as it could be. And so then, then, uh, here Jesus walks on the water, and he's meeting them. And they're scared. Peter then says, oh, if it's you, I want to come out and be with you. And, And so in Matthew chapter 14, verse 28, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he took his eyes off Christ. And he's losing his vision here. He's losing the vision of why he's even doing this. He sees the wind. He sees, he sees these waves underneath him. And when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of Peter and said, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Boom, it all stops. It's all calm when Jesus is there. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, Peter had great vision. But he lost that vision. And here are the people who are working on this, on this wall. They've been working on it for so long. 16 feet thick. The wall is half, half high. But now they're getting tired. And they're losing their vision for this thing. The piles of, they're looking at the piles of rubble. And they're not looking at the Lord. They're not looking at what the end product is going to be. And so like Peter, who was worn out from rowing his, that boat, Peter's vision was lost. And sometimes the jobs that we have seem bigger and bigger and bigger. But yet, the Lord knows that that storm's going to be there. Our political situation that's going on right now, do you think that, that was, that's a surprise to God? Not at all. He knows the end from the beginning. It doesn't depend on us. It depends on Him. Now, going along with that discouragement factor number two, loss of vision, comes a third, a loss of confidence. And those two are hand in hand. Nehemiah 4.10. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild the wall. We can't do it. Okay, how many times have you done it? Or you've been with others who say this? Whether they're little kids or grown-ups, they just throw it down and say, I can't do this. I can't do this. Okay. So a loss of confidence along with that loss of vision. Now, how did Nehemiah deal with this? With this discouragement born of weariness and rubble and loss of vision and and loss of confidence? In uh, chapter 4, verse 21, first he used the potential attack as a way to give some rest to the wall builders. You don't really read it that way, but you see that that's what happens. So we labored on the work and half of them held spears. So you got half the people working, the other half of the people are holding the spears, waiting for an attack, but they're able just to kind of get some rest. Not everybody is working full blast. And then they switch off and give some rest to the others. Second, he cut out unnecessary things. Now he, And it gave people some other time to rest. Because at this time, the people lived in the outskirts of the city. They would get up in the morning before the sun would rise, they would come into the, to the town and they would start building the wall at sunup. He said, forget this commute, live here. And so he, he commanded the folks, okay, now everybody needs to live within the wall. And so you can sleep a little longer, you can get up now and you can just go straight to work. The, the part of your work is right there where you're sleeping. Just get up and do some work. So in verse 22, I said to the people, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem. Stay here, that they may be a guard for us by, by night, may labor by day. And also, in verse 23, none of us took off our clothes. We didn't waste time washing clothes. Now, some may consider that washing clothes is a necessity, but when you're under threat of attack, probably washing your clothes and going out and scrubbing stuff is probably the least of your worries. Now, the fourth discouragement factor, I'm going to concentrate on and talk a lot about here, but I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about it next time. Discouragement factor number four, betrayal by people who are your leaders. People who are in leadership positions over you betray you. It is not unusual for, we, we put way too much confidence in people. 
uh, whether it's a church that has a pastor that the people know and love and the pastor has been there for years and years and then the pastor betrays them in some way. And then people are discouraged and they fall away it's because their eyes are on a person. Their eyes are not on Christ. There's a concept in, in economics. I used to teach economics for many years. So I'm going to teach you two things about economics. The first concept is a concept called opportunity cost. Opportunity cost means that whenever you make a decision for something, you're making a decision against something else. When you guys came here for the service, you obviously were choosing not to do something else. Okay? You can't be two places at once. Every time you choose to do one thing, you're choosing not to do something else. When you want to buy something, you're not buying something else. That's the concept of opportunity cost. And in theory, the way economists put it, the thing that you choose to do is the thing that has more value to you than this thing. You always choose the thing that has the highest value. So that, you know, when you're sitting in front of the TV set, you're not spending that time doing something else. When you're spending money on one thing, you're not spending money on something else. When you're working on one thing in your basement, you're not working on something else. When you spend four hours riding your Harley with Christian brothers and sisters, you're not wasting your time doing something inconsequential. Okay? Um, so when you do something, you're choosing not to do something else. Now, the question is, while these, were these builders, were these wall builders that Nehemiah was using, were they, what, were these, what would these people be doing if they weren't building a wall? And the, the answer is, they were farmers. These people gave up their jobs. These people have been working on this wall, and they haven't been working on their farms. So think about it. They gave up their personal lives. They gave up their regular jobs of farming during a prime part of the year when the crops would be coming in. They gave up their incomes. And I can only imagine that as they're working, building this wall, they're thinking to themselves, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to feed my family? Because I'm doing this. It would be like having a church work day, but it's a church work several months all through the summer where from sun up till the stars come out, you are working and you're not going to your regular job. You're not getting a paycheck. Think about it. These people are real heroes, but nobody ever thinks about these guys. So, of course, uh, the people who were not building the walls, there were some folks who were... Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be too judgmental about them and implying motives here, but there were folks who were not building the wall. There were Jewish people who were there not building the wall, and it was not because they were infirm. It was not because they were old. It was not because they were women. It was just because they chose not to do it. So these people who were not building the wall, what were they doing? They were busy praying for these people, right? No. They were busy going out and earning money so they could feed these people, right? Wrong. These were their leaders. And the leaders were doing some things that were contrary to them. Take a look in Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those that said, With our sons and with our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. So here the wall builders are saying, we got to eat, and we don't have a paycheck. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain. We're not getting a paycheck, so I'm going to have to borrow the money. And if I'm borrowing the money, I've got to use something as collateral. So I'm using my vineyards, our fields, and our houses. We're mortgaging those to get grain because of the famine. Oh, now this is the first time we've heard about this. Another thing that was kicking them in the teeth at the time while they're building it is that there's a famine going on in the land. Remember, things just keep coming and coming and coming in waves. So on top of all these other problems, now we're hearing that there's a famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and on our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. Not only were they pledging their fields and their vineyards and their houses as collateral, they were, they were pledging their children as collateral as well. And obviously they don't have the money to pay the loans back. So what happened? These Jewish brothers were repossessing their children and turning them into their slaves. Now that is just flat out wrong. But it is not in our power to help it, it says in verse 5, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. 
So the first concept I told you about economics was this concept of opportunity cost. Second is the law of supply and demand. Law of supply and demand. Food is in, so here's food. It's in scarce quantity uh, because A, less farmers to make it, and also a famine. But yet the demand was getting higher because these people are working hard. You need to eat more. So demand is high. Supply is low. Prices start going up. And then these people, of course, don't have any money to buy it. And so they have to go and they have to borrow the money. And so <coughs> the greed, there was some greed there. It caused their brethren, the Jews, <coughs> to raise their prices on it as well. So these dedicated godly wall builders had four complaints. Number one, some of us have large families and we have to spend money we don't have to pay prices for, higher prices for food. Two, in order to pay these higher prices during this time of lower income, we have to borrow money and pledge our farmland and homes as collateral. Three, also we've had to borrow money to pay our taxes. Four, we've had to pledge ourselves and our children as collateral, so we are owned by our brothers and our children are now their children, and we don't have any money to buy them back. We can't redeem them. We have nothing. Now talk about discouragement. God, you called me to do this. You called me to build this wall. Look what's happening to me. My children are gone. My strength is gone. I'm worn out. These people are threatening to kill me. It's time for me just to give up and go. Forget it. This Christianity stuff, I've had it. Talk about discouragement. A lot of discouraging factors going on. And so all of these factors have happened. And then now at the very end, who's piling on but their own Jewish brothers? Now, I'm all, for, I'm all for the free market. I'm a free market kind of guy, and I'm for making a profit. But during a time of war and during a time of national emergency, the rules are off. Okay, I about went nuts when I was seeing pictures on the news with this hurricane that was coming through and these gas station owners as people are trying to flee, they're charging 10 bucks a gallon for gas. They're charging 40 bucks for a flat of 24 bottles of water. Come on. That's just flat out wrong. You need to be thrown under the jail. Okay? And so here is a, this is a perfect time for these wealthy rulers, their brothers, the Jews, to show their special support for this project that's going on. But they, like today, the rich don't get rich by being generous. The rich get rich by taking advantage of others, generally speaking. Nehemiah 5.1 now there arose an outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brother. Now this, this word outcry is, is a word, it, the Hebrew word is sa'acha. Sa'acha is the Hebrew word. The word outcry, sa'acha, it's a shriek of distress. It is not just, oh, you people, you're so bad. It's, ah, that's sa'acha. Now sa'acha, this Hebrew word has been used in other places in Scripture. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their sacha, their cry of their taskmasters. In Exodus chapter 22, in verses 20 through 27. He that sacrificeth unto any god, save unto the Lord, only he shall be utterly destroyed. Now it's talking about the law here. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger, nor oppress him. For we were strangers in the land of Egypt. You, Jewish people, shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Verse 23. If you afflict them, if you afflict your brothers in any way, and they cry, they sa'acha at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. If you are if you are mistreating your brothers, the Jews, and my wrath shall wax hot. There's that hot again. And I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. Now catch this, verse 25 of Exodus 22. If you lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, he's talking about Jews to Jews, Thou shalt not be to him as a usurer, that is, you aren't, aren't going to collect interest, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury or interest. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge as collateral, you shall give it back to him by the time the sun goeth down. For that is his covering only, and it is his raiment for his skin, Where, wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, 
for I am gracious. I'm gracious to them. I'm not going to be gracious to you because you're just wrong. In Leviticus chapter 25, it talks about how we treat brothers. Leviticus 25, beginning in verse 35. And if your brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him, yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take no usury. Don't take interest on loans or increase. In other words, just loan to them because he's your brother. But fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him money upon usury, nor lend him your food, your victuals for increase. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, give you the land of Canaan, and to be your God. And if your brother that dwelleth with thee be waxen poor, and be sold unto thee, Thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant. God was telling these people, this is the law. You should not do this. And Nehemiah is going to him and saying, look, this is wrong. But as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and he shall serve thee until the year of Jubilee. So Nehemiah had had enough. All of these discouraging factors are coming. And this stuff is now that he's hearing this cry of these people. Apparently he wasn't aware of it until just now when these people are crying out saying our own Jewish brothers are loaning us money and now they're repossessing our children. What? Nehemiah, you know, normally he was very calm when all these things happened. He just went to the Lord in prayer. But listen to what happened here. Now, when, when the situation is out of our control, when it's something that we have absolutely no control over. Nehemiah has no control over Sanballat and Tobiah, so what do you do? You go to the person who does have control over it, God. So he goes and he prays to God. When a situation happens that you do have some control over, you take action. And he did. He dealt with the issue. Take a look in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 6. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. This word angry, again, is the word, Hebrew word, and, and think of the word hot. I was hot. I was really, really angry. The only other, the, there are only two other times that this word angry is coming up in Nehemiah, and that's when Sanballat and Tobiah were angry because the wall was being built. They were hot. So now it's talking about how Nehemiah was hot. Nehemiah wasn't hot because God's work was going forward. Nehemiah was getting hot because people who are supposed to be behind this project are not. And in fact, they're working against it. So he was very hot. Now, I'm going uh, to read Nehemiah 5, 7 through 13. I'm not going to comment a lot on it uh, because next time when we get together, I'm going to talk about how he dealt with this disunity. So he didn't blow up at him. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's really interesting how he dealt with this disunity. But Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 7 through 13. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and they could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. He says, I'm loaning these people money so they can live. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day, their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. And in verse 13, I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, garment and said so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. In other words, you will keep this promise or God will shake you out. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they, prom as they promised. And so next time I'm going to talk about how he did this. What was his strategy in dealing with these people in these verses? 
So the title of this message is Dealing with Discouragement, Things That Happen From Within. Saw how discouragement comes from a loss of strength, a loss of vision, a loss of confidence, really a loss of faith and leadership. Um, those who, who, who are um, those leaders who are now working against us. Now, we aren't responsible for the trials that come in many cases. We aren't responsible for these problems that occur in our lives because of those problems. But as leaders, as parents, grandparents, friends of others, we are responsible for how we respond to them. Uh, is that response a I give up kind of a response? So it's clear that Nehemiah was not nonplussed. He was affected by this, these discouraging factors. They did bother him, but he took them to God in prayer. He laid them at God's feet, and he continued to do so, and that's what we have to do. Um, because we have to get, regain that vision and see where we're going with this. I was looking at our hymnal. I didn't see the song there, but I want to share with you the words of a song that help us with our vision. Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur, and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away, all tears forever over, in God's eternal day. The second verse says, Sometimes the sky looks dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. But there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problem. Just go to him in prayer. The third verse is, Life's day will soon be o'er. All storms forever past. We'll cross the great divide to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven. A harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burden down. And the chorus is, It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Discouragement will come. It is going to come, and it comes in waves, and it just keeps hitting us. But remember, it will be worth it all. Let's pray. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.